So come from a ministry called Answers in Genesis, and I want you to think about the word answers this morning, because uh, this afternoon, because answers is what we're all about, giving people answers. You know, this is back to school Sunday, and so we're thinking about kids going back to school, and you know, it's, it's a sad fact that the majority of young people are leaving the church in America and in our Western world, and most are not returning. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they didn't have answers to the questions of the world, to the attacks on the Bible that cause them to doubt and not believe the Bible. And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, in this particular presentation. Well, I want to show you a picture of our 16 grandchildren. And we praise the Lord that our kids are passing on that spiritual legacy to their kids. And also mentioned to you the Creation Museum, as the pastor mentioned, was opened in 2007. It's an incredible facility. It's a whole walk through the Bible animatronics, life-size exhibits, planetarium, special effects theater. We just opened a new 4D theater on Friday, and it has uh, interactive uh, infrared glasses, so it's better 3D than what you see even in the movie theaters. And it's a walk through the Bible, what we call the seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ's cross, consummation. And I wanted to mention that to you because we're going to talk a little bit about that today, the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological history that the world says is not true, but it's actually the history that's foundational to all of our doctrines, to the gospel. It's foundation to our Christian worldview. And then two years ago, we opened the life-size Ark Encounter. We have a massive parking lot. These are both in northern Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati. And this is a, an incredible complex. We have a zoo and all sorts of other things outside. And then you can actually go over to the Ark. It's the biggest timber frame structure in the world. It's one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field. It's built 15 feet off the ground and stands seven stories high and 10 stories high at the bow. And you will actually walk uh, through the whole Ark. You can go through all three decks, uh, as you see there. And there's all sorts of exhibits giving you answers, just like we do at the Creation Museum, but it's different. And we have answers, how can Noah fit all the animals on the ark? And uh, uh, how many kinds went on the ark? Not species, but kinds. How could he feed them? How could he look after them? How could Noah build the ark? And really it's showing people, hey, this is the size of this ship. And there was tons of room. It's giving answers because one of the questions that uh, your kids are going to hear is, how could Noah fit the animals on the ark? There's no evidence for the flood. How could Noah build the ark? So we answer all those questions. And it really is the quality of Disney, or even better. I, a lot of people say it's actually better quality. For a start, the wood's real. So it's better. And now, I just found out when I came down here in Texas, I am now known as the Ark Man. Uh, so there you are. Well, what I wanted to do this morning, um, I keep saying this morning, knowing this afternoon, that's all right. Uh, what I wanted to do was to actually bring two verses of Scripture to your attention. First Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense, give an answer. And that word defense or answer comes from the Greek word apologia, from which we get a word apologetics, which means to give a logical reason defense of the faith. And I'm going to challenge us that most churches, most Christian homes have not been teaching apologetics, which means giving our kids answers for the skeptical questions of this day, we haven't been teaching that to them, and so it's very easy for them to be led astray by what they're going to hear at school uh, or through the media, uh, through it, wherever it is. And so this is a really important word to understand. And then Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Foundations are important. Actually, Genesis is the foundation for the whole of the Bible and for our Christian worldview. I want to talk about thinking foundationally. So this is what I want you to go away with today. I want you to go away with thinking foundationally and teaching apologetics. You know, our whole Western world is becoming less Christian every day from a worldview perspective. And we see moral relativism permeating the culture. Who would have ever thought that we'd be battling over, you know, whether you can have male and female restrooms, battling over the gender issue, the gay marriage issue, the abortion issue, euthanasia, and so it goes on. And we look at our culture and we say, what has happened? But I think it's really easy to understand what has happened. And that is... We can read the description in Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. When there's no absolute authority, who determines right or wrong? When there's no absolute authority, anything goes. And basically what I would say is this. What has happened in our culture, we used to raise generations up to believe God's word, 
or even non-Christians had a respect for God's word and so our worldview came out of God's word. That was true of the founding fathers. Most were Christian or at least had a respect for the Bible and so therefore marriage was a man and a woman because you started with the Bible. God told us what's right and what's wrong. Abortion was wrong because it's killing a human being. But the more we have generations now who have been told, no, uh, the Bible's not true. And think about it, even though there might be a number of you here today that are teachers in the public education system. I was the teacher in that system. You're missionaries in that system. And you need our prayers, by the way. I know it's increasingly difficult. But by and large, we know that that system has thrown God out, the Bible out, prayer out, creation out. And now the textbooks explain that you can uh, understand the whole of reality by natural processes. Naturalism, by the way, is a religion. It's really the religion of atheism. See, there are people today that tell us, oh, they took religion out of the public schools. No, they didn't. They took Christianity out. Because the Bible says you're either for Christ or what? Against. You're either walking in light or walking in what? Darkness. There's no neutral position. And so when, when they say, well, the state's not allowed to teach a religion, the state is teaching a religion. The state religion of our culture is naturalism or atheism, and our tax dollars are paying for that. But think about it. Generations, kids are being brought up to believe the Bible has nothing to do with their worldview. But in actual fact, what they're really being taught is it's man that determines their worldview. And this is what's happening. And when man is the foundation for your worldview, then ultimately anything goes. And that's why the culture has changed. That's what's happening. And you know, it's also a reflection of something else that's happening. Two thirds of young people are walking away from the church by the time they reach college age in America, and very few are returning. And this should be alarming to all of us. We did the research on this and, and went and asked uh, these young people why they learned through, why they left through researchers. And over and over again, it came down to because of what they taught at school, science conflicted with the Bible, supposedly, and how can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? And you see, they, they have the idea that, hey, you look at this world, if you say God created this, look at all the death and suffering and evil, they weren't taught to think foundationally, and they weren't taught apologetics, how to defend their faith. Let me show you what's happening in America. It's already happened in most of the Western world. Let me show you what's happening in America. This should be alarming to every one of us. And think about your kids and where they're going to be at in regard to this. Uh, researchers divide uh, groups in America according to when they were born. And this is research done by the Pew Research Group. Attendance at religious services by generation. Percent saying they attend several times a week, every week, or nearly every week. The greatest generation, born before 1928, 56% of that group went to church. The silent generation, born 28 to 45, 44% went to church. Uh, the boomers, born 46 to 64, 32%, I'm in that group. Uh, generation X, born 65 to 80, 27%. But look at the millennials, only 18% go to church. And Generation Z is less than that. That's the post-millennials. People, that's the future of America. You're looking at it right there, unless we do something about that. And I want to share with you what we need to be doing here today. And then have a look at the changing world view of our culture. Views of homosexuality by generation. Percent saying same-sex sexual relations are always wrong. 78% of the greatest said that. 70% of the silent said that. Only 56% of the boomers. Generation X, now you're getting below 50%, 47%. Millennials, 43%. And the Generation Z are way under that. The whole world view is changing in America. Uh, the, the church is changing. This nation, this culture, is headed on a catastrophic downward spiral. And we have to ask ourselves, what happened? And actually, if we study God's word, we would understand what's going on. Because what happened began in a garden 6,000 years ago. It was a battle between two religions. See, we've got the idea there are lots of different religions in the world. I'm going to say to you, ultimately, there's only two. Because God said to Adam, as a test of obedience, you can eat all the trees, only one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. Obey God's word. The devil came to Eve and said, did God actually say? In other words, you don't have to obey God's word. You can decide truth for yourself, because then went on and said, you will be like God. You can be your own God. And right there it set the scene for a spiritual battle. It is raging before us today. And if we have not understood that battle and have not trained our children to understand that battle, 
We're going to continue to lose this culture and to lose generations from the church. You see, what began there was a battle between God's word and man's word, a battle between two foundations, a battle between two religions. See, one of the things that we have to understand is this. Our thinking just doesn't come from out of the air somewhere. We have a foundation that determines our worldview. For someone who's an atheist, you know, sadly, in our education system at the universities and so on, students today are taught, look, scientists are all neutral and they start with evidence to determine their theories. They don't start with ideas, they start with evidence. Well, that's just nonsense. Because if that scientist is an atheist, he's already rejected the evidence that this is the word of God. He's rejected that evidence. If he's an atheist, he's already said, no matter what I find, everything's explained by natural processes. They start with a foundation that determines their worldview by which they look at the evidence. Young people remember that when you're reading the secular uh, textbooks and so on. They're not starting with evidence. They start with the foundation. What is their foundation? If it's not God's word, there's only one other foundation. What is it? Man's word. See, let me explain it to you more this way. When uh, we flew into Texas, I took particular note of how you build houses here. It's very different. I noticed that you put the roof up first, and then you put the walls under the roof, and then you put the foundation under the walls, correct? Now, you would say to me, of course not. That'd be a stupid way to build a house. I agree. It wouldn't work. Hey, I'm going to say this to us. I think a lot of people in our churches... Have, and the reason we're seeing the changing worldview and the changing numbers in the church is because we've tried to build in the next generation the structure of Christianity with the roof and the walls without the foundation. What's happened is we've handed them over to the world who's given them the foundation of man's word and we've tried to impose the gospel and the Christian worldview on that foundation but it won't stand. You see, the way to build a house is to start with the foundation and then build the walls, and then build the roof. You've got to have the right foundation. For us as Christians, the right foundation is the Word of God. In fact, understand something. And young people, understand this. This is not just a guidebook to life. This is not just a book on moral and spiritual things. Do you realize the moral things, the spiritual things, all of that is based in history. It's a history God reveals to us of geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology. The history in Genesis, in fact, the Genesis, Genesis 1 to 11 is like the foundation to the house. The rest of the Bible is the house. It's, and the whole of the Bible is the foundation for our worldview. And so I want us to understand that when you have these two different foundations, you have two totally different worldviews. And I think a lot of what's happening in our culture today, Christians are accused of, oh, you people are full of hate speech if you believe in, in, in marriages as a man and a woman or you're against abortion. I mean, it's interesting the terms they use for me. You don't believe in abortion, you're a misogynist. You don't believe in gay marriage, you're homophobic. And, and they accuse us of having hate speech because what's happening is they have a worldview and they see the clash of our worldview with them and, and they recognize that clash but what they don't understand is their worldview is because they have a, a particular foundation. Our worldview is because we have a different foundation. And if we don't understand that and haven't taught our children that, they're not going to know how to be able to talk to these people and how to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in our culture. You see, our children are growing up in a culture where, you know, Scripture talks about children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You think about it. They're out there, and as they're in school or university or wherever they are in the culture, mixing with their friends, they're going to be dealing with these issues, euthanasia, abortion, gay marriage, male and female restrooms, transgender, I, I mean, evolution, creation. How do they know how to approach these issues? How do they know how to deal with them? How do, how do they explain to someone what they believe? What do they believe what they do? Because increasingly in the church, young people will support gay marriage in the church. The majority do. The majority will support abortion. You know, you hear things like, well, a woman has a right to do what she wants with her body. Actually, a fertilized egg is, is not her body. It's an individual. But look, let me explain this to you practically. Recently, earlier this year, I was invited to the University of Central Oklahoma, a publicly funded university, uh, to give a lecture. I was invited by the student group. And suddenly, it got cancelled 
because the LGBT group complained that because I believe marriage is a man and a woman, that's hate speech, and they're bringing someone who is going to give hate speech to the university. So there were headlines in the paper, UCO student group rescinds invitation to Christian speaker. Well, the university had so much pressure from all sorts of people across the nation. It was in the news, legislators, and in regard to First Amendment issues and all sorts of things that the president decided to invite me as a speaker at the university. So new headlines, UCO plans free speech event with controversial speaker. So now I'm the controversial speaker. That's because I believe the Bible, that's why. <laughs> you believe the Bible these days? You're controversial, right? And so I took one of our scientists with us, Dr. Georgia Purdom. She's a PhD in molecular genetics. And I said, look, I'll give the first part of the presentation and explain what we believe as Christians and why. Then I want you to give a specific presentation on one particular scientific aspect, actually genetics and natural selection, to show we know our science and that uh, to help them understand uh, that we can answer their objections to believing uh, God's word. And so we turned up at the university. It was interesting. Here we are. We turn up. It's a packed auditorium, thanks to all the publicity. And... The cameras were down here. The media were there in droves with their cameras running. And I looked at the audience. The president, because of all the publicity, the president and his whole council came and sat there to be there. And then there were other professors there. There were non-Christian professors, Christian professors, non-Christian students, Christian students, people from the outside, Christians, non-Christians. And then the LGBT group took up a whole row in the auditorium on one side. And the woman professor who heads the group who opposed me in the first place, all sitting there. And I'm looking at this group, and I, I say to myself, Lord, why do you get me into these things? <laughs> and then I look at it and I realized, this is the world. This is the world we live in. So how as Christians do we speak to them so they don't see us and, and interpret it as hate speech, they understand that we love them, and yet at the same time, be bold and unashamed about what we believe in our Christian faith. And so this is what I did, and this, this is what I think is missing, because see, and, and a lot of church, a lot of uh, people today have this idea, oh, if you're going to go out there and witness to non-Christians, or you're going to witness in the school or the university, you can't use the Bible, because as soon as you use the Bible, they say that's religion, and they're not interested. But wait a minute, if you give up God's word, then there's only one other foundation. What is it? man's word, then you've lost the battle anyway. And that's a problem that we have because people aren't thinking foundationally. So the first thing I said to them, and it was interesting because they all listened, and, and I said, I'm a Christian. I'm unashamed about who I am. This, is, this Bible that claims to be the word of God, I believe it is the word of God, and he reveals to us uh, specific uh, information, specific history that I believe is true. That's the foundation of our worldview. I want you to understand why we as Christians, creationists, believe the way we do. I want you to see where, where our thinking comes from. And I'm not going to shy away from issues like abortion and marriage and gender. I, I was wondering what was going through the thoughts of the LGBT group as I said that. And so what I did was I, I based what I'm, what I'm going to do on what we do at the Creation Museum, where we walk people through that geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology in the Bible, answer skeptical questions, and say that history is true, and then present the gospel and the Christian doctrines based in that history. And so I said, let me walk you through and show you why we believe what we do as Christians. I believe that God created. Hey, just a little bit of evidence here. The DNA molecule that makes life... Uh, DNA actually is an information system and a language system. Languages can't come from matter by themselves. Matter never produces information. Actually, DNA cries out that there has to be a designer, a creator. I believe that designer is the creator God of the Bible. The Bible goes on and says God created kinds of animals according to their kind. We actually believe dogs always remain dogs, cats always remain cats. I realize that's radical, but that's what uh, we believe. We do believe in natural selection. We do believe in adaptation. We do believe in speciation, but it's got nothing to do with evolution because dogs remain dogs, different species of dogs, they're just dogs. And so I said, actually, that answers the question how Noah could fit all the animals on the ark because he didn't need all the species, just the representative kinds. And Dr. Purdom's going to give more of a presentation dealing with the genetics of that. And then I went on and said, also, the Bible tells us that man is made in God's image. None of the animals were, so we're different to the animals. I had an atheist once who said to me, you know, well, 
what does it mean that man is made in God's image? I said, go down to the local zoo and talk to one of the apes and you'll find out. Uh, so man is made in God's image. We're different to the animals, right? And that's an important issue in regard to abortion. I'll explain in a moment. Male and female, he created them. Hey, you know what the Bible says? The created order is male and female. And so, therefore, even though we, it's, there are some people, exceptions today, that have some issues because we've got to understand from a biblical framework that sin has affected the world, and so now there are mutations and so on, but the created order is male and female. But then I said to them, but if you don't believe that same foundation, if you don't believe the Bible like I do, I can understand you're going to have a whole different view in regard to gender. I get that. Because you, you can interpret it however you want. Um, and then... I said, so man was made in God's image. That deals with the abortion issue. You see, when an egg is fertilized, and that's a human egg fertilized and then dividing, the first division. Well, one set of DNA comes from the mother, one from the father, and then you get fertilization. It's a unique combination of information. It's different to the mother and different to the father. You look different than your mother or your father, but all your information came from them. So it's a unique individual at fertilization. No new information is added as the cell divides. No new information is added. So you are uniquely you, human, right at fertilization. So abortion is killing a human being made in the image of God. I said, now, if you, if you believe man is just an animal and you don't believe the Bible, I totally get it. Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? And, you know, I spoke on this at the Creation Museum um, a few months ago. And afterwards, a young lady came out to me and she looked at me and she said, I've been brought up in the church all my life and nobody ever explained that to me about being made in God's image and the difference between humans and animals like that. And nobody ever explained to me about DNA and it's a unique combination. So it's not part of the mother's body, it's an individual. And so, it's, uh, so she said, nobody ever explained that to me. And then she looked at me and she said with tears in her eyes, what if someone like me has had an abortion? And I said to her, you know what the Bible says? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It tells us he removes our sins as, as far as the east is from the west and he'll remember them no more. And she looked at me with a big smile and she said, thank you. And you know what hit me? I was thinking, how, how many of our Christian homes and churches are raising up generations to think foundationally to be able to understand what we believe in regard to abortion and why and how we can explain it to somebody. And you know, I made sure that I said to the group, if you don't have the same foundation I have, I get it. You get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids, we're just animals. But, if, but, but I start from a different foundation that we're made in the image of God. And so we, we have a worldview difference here. I get that, I understand that. And then I said, the Bible goes on and says, God made man from dust. He brought the animals to him to name, and there were none like him. He was different to the animals. So God put him to sleep, and from his rib he made the first woman. By the way, the woman came from the man, the man came from dust. You can't, you can't say God used evolution, because the man didn't come from an ape man, and the woman didn't come from an ape woman. And after God made the woman, the man said, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. And Paul says that in the New Testament. The woman came from man. And then it goes on and says, therefore, now this is the reason. God made male and female. He made man from dust. He made the female from the male and says, this is the reason a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall be one flesh. This is the reason for marriage. Marriage is to be one man and one woman. I know there are many young people, even in our churches today, because we've done the research on this, will say, well, as long as two people love each other, but that's not what marriage is all about. And then they'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with same-sex marriage. There's no such thing as same-sex marriage, because marriage is a God-ordained institution. You can have same-sex union, but marriage, that's a God-ordained institution. But see, you need to think foundationally. So what is marriage all about? Where did it come from? Who defines what it is? In fact, when Jesus, who's the Son of God, was asked about marriage in the New Testament, it's recorded in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, he said, haven't you read, he which made the beginning made the male and female, that's Genesis 127, and said, for this cause shall a man of his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they'll be one flesh. What Jesus was saying is the history in Genesis is true, that's why the doctrine is true, it's to be a man and a woman. 
And by the way, not just marriage, but ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. And so if you want to raise your children up to know what they believe, why they believe what they do, you've got to teach them how to think foundationally, starting with God's Word, and specifically Genesis 1 to 11, to know why we believe what we do, and to raise them up to understand if somebody has the, doesn't have that foundation, they're going to have a whole different worldview. And see, a lot of times I think we try to force our worldview on people who don't have the foundation for it. And so instead of saying, that's wrong, that's evil, that's sin, we've got to remember, if they don't have the foundation from God's Word, they're not going to understand that when I say that. So it's so important that we teach them to think foundationally. And you know, we go on here and we find out that something happened to the world we live in. You see, God said everything was very good, but we see a world full of death. The non-Christians, this is why I wanted to do this at university, they get the idea, they think wrongly, that we believe God made this world as it is. He did not. He made the original world, and this has suffered from sin and the curse and the flood and the Tower of Babel and so on. Death entered the world because of sin. Adam, if you rebel, and I said, that's where sin comes from. That's why Christians believe in sin. That's why we believe we're all sinners, because with sin came death. I said, that's why we die. And then I made sure they knew. I said, you realize every one of you in this room is going to die, right? <laughs> I just want to make sure they remember that. And then it gave me an opportunity because I talked about the origin of death from the Bible. It gave me the opportunity and the origin of sin to, to present the gospel to them. And I said, do you know what happened when Adam sinned? God made garments of skins the origin of clothing. Think about it. Animals don't wear clothes. Why do humans wear clothes? Because God gave clothes because of sin. It was the first blood sacrifice, a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Blood represents life. We committed high treason against the God of creation. We sinned against God. We sinned in Adam. We forfeited our right to live. Our bodies will die. We're made in the image of God. We have a soul that's going to live forever. God wants us to spend forever with him. And so what he was doing was saying, there is a way in which I'm going to enable you to come back to be with me. Now, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin, which is why the Israelites sacrificed animals over and over and over again. A man brought sin and death into the world. A man would neither pay the penalty for sin, but it would have to be a perfect man, not a sinner. But it has to be one of us. But it can't be one of us. We're all sinners. God stepped into history to be the God-man. The babe in a manger. And I said to the group, you've heard of the babe in the manger. He's the son of God, the God-man, a perfect man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. And so they heard the gospel. And then I said, now you have to also understand, if you believe in millions of years, you believe the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man. In the Bible, we find something interesting because... In the fossil layers, we find evidence of animals eating each other and bones in their stomachs, but the Bible says originally Adam and Eve and the animals were vegetarian. We weren't told we could eat meat until after the flood. And if you believe in millions of years, then think about this. In the fossil record, there's evidence of cancer, tumors, infections, abscesses. Wait a minute. The Bible says after God made everything and he made man and woman, he said everything was very good. God doesn't call cancer very good. This world is not very good. We recognize that. These two things can't be true at the same time. So all those layers of fossils, you say, were laid down over millions of years, we would say had to come after sin. Is there anything in the Bible that could explain billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? How about the flood of Noah's day? If there really was a global flood, what would we expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And I didn't have a lot of time with them, but I, I just threw in a little slide of this and said, oh, by the way, at the Grand Canyon, you have layers laid directly one on top of the other where evolutionists say there's five to ten million years missing, but they're not missing, they just never were there. Just a little aside for you. <laughs> and then the Bible goes on to tell us about an event called the Tower of Babel. God gave different languages as people increased on the earth again, forming different people groups, not different races. So if the Bible's right, there's only one race of people. There aren't any different races. Everyone in this room belongs to Adam's race, right? That's what I make sure when I'm filling out those stupid forms at doctor's offices these days. What race are you? Adams. <laughs> and you know, back in the year 2000, 
the Human Genome Project led by an atheist. Do you know what they did? They mapped human genes from around the world. Do you know what they said? We found there's only one race. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Of course there's only one race. You know, if, if we had it raised up in our churches, generations of people who understood the foundational history in the Bible, the church would have been leading the way in dealing with racism and prejudice. There's only one race. And I said to uh, the people there, and actually I showed them some uh, pictures of our skin and that to show everybody has the same skin color. It's just different shades. We have a pigment called melanin. And th that's just a little bit of genetic diversity. It's nothing major. Th those are just, uh, uh, just surface differences. They're not much at all. And I said, we all belong to one race. We're all equal before God. We're all one family, and we need to love each other as family. And you know they all clapped. I don't think they knew what they were clapping, but they clapped. Because that is the message of the Bible. And we do need to love each other. And I wanted the LGBT group to know they're related to me. They're, they're our family. And Jesus died for, for all of them. And so what I was doing was teaching apologetics, helping them understand whether it's biology, geology, anthropology, astronomy, that it confirms the Bible's history. And I was helping them understand about thinking foundationally where my thinking comes from, and I was getting them to, to, to really understand you have a foundation too. Because they've got this idea they don't, but they do. And then at the end, we had a question time. And it was interesting. One of the questions was written in by the LGBT group. And this was it here. And here I am saying, how am I going to answer this because I, I need them to understand I don't hate them because we have a different view, different worldview. And it's actually interesting that the answer I gave was written up in one of the news articles that was syndicated across the nation and one of the local TV stations reported on it. And after the, the program, I actually had a professor come to me and say, you really disarmed the whole situation. Because here's the question. I'm a spirit-filled Christian and also part of the LGBTQ community. I sought the Lord in churches for why I feel attracted to the same sex. I found the church nor the church's traditional view of LGBTQ experience fit my experience of hearing the Lord speak directly to me. Science, not the church, gave me peace. How can you say my experience of still being a child of God and LGBTQ I, I isn't valid? And so I, I said to the, to the audience, I said, I've been talking about God's written word and you're saying you're a Christian and God spoke to you and you have a different view in regard to uh, marriage and, and, and sex and so on than I do. And I said, if you say God spoke to you, then if this is the same God, his spoken word can't be contrary to his written word. So I said, you and I must have a different interpretation of Genesis. So what you and I need to do is to get together and have a discussion as to why you and I have this different interpretation. Because there's no point in talking about the worldview issues of same sex and so on until you and I get down and talk about our foundational difference. Because this is where, this is where the conflict is. And I had a student come down to me and say, you really put the LGBT group on the back foot. Somebody said, you know, that they were expecting you to come across with hate, what they call hate speech. Well, that's wrong, and you're wrong, and that's evil. But I recognize, how can I impose my worldview if they don't have the foundation? And people, I want to ask us, have we been raising up generations of our kids to think foundationally, to understand what they believe, why they believe what they do? Have we equipped them with answers to defend the Christian faith? Because they're going to get all sorts of questions about how do you know the Bible's true, and, and Noah couldn't get the animals on the ark, and science has disproved the Bible, and the Bible's a book of mythology, and, and you know, where the races of people come from. They're going to get all those sorts of questions. Have we taught them those answers equipped to defend the Christian faith, and have we helped them understand and taught them that the foundation of our worldview comes from God's Word so they know what they believe, why they believe what they do, and if somebody doesn't have that foundation, they're going to different, have a different one, they have a different worldview to know how to talk to them as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my challenge to us. You know, one of the things that we do as a ministry 
is provide the resources for you to do that. And we have, um, you'll see special combination prices as we do. For instance, our core resources, those five top books there, 160 of the most asked questions with detailed answers. Just about any, just about the, uh, all the questions that you're gonna hear, your kids are gonna hear at school, university, in the culture, are dealt with there. I encourage you all to get equipped with those answers. My book, The Lie, deals with the importance of the book of Genesis and how foundational it is to all of our doctrine. Gospel Reset, how to present the gospel in a culture where they no longer believe the Bible as a foundation. How do you do that? And we have answers books for, for kids, middle school and younger, and books on all sorts of topics for them to help them understand the Bible's truth. This would be great for you as a family, an introductory apologetics program, 12, 30-minute videos with a study guide uh, that goes with them and so on. Our family magazine, Answers, nothing like it in the world. It's award-winning, but to equip you in apologetics and to think foundationally. You know, the ministry of Answers in Genesis, I believe, is a cutting-edge ministry for today to help each one of us be equipped with answers and to challenge us to think foundationally from God's Word. I think a lot of times, because we didn't know how to deal with the book of Genesis, we sort of put that over here somewhere. We want to tell people about Jesus, but if they don't have the foundation from Genesis, they're not going to understand who Jesus is. If they don't have the foundation to understand the origin of sin or death, they won't understand what the gospel is all about. If they don't have the foundation in Genesis about Adam and Eve, they're not going to understand what marriage is all about. If they don't have the foundation in regard to made in God's image, they're not going to understand what the abortion issue is all about. And see, not only that, none of us are going to understand that, that foundation unless we commit to believe in the one who gave us this word and the one who is the word, the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason we do what we do is not just to equip you and it's not just to get you thinking foundationally, but it's because we want to point you to the most important message in the entire universe. When you come and visit the ark, no, so I said when, you come and visit the ark, or come at Christmas and see our spectacular uh, Christmas uh, lights and programs and so on. But on the second deck, we have this one door and there's an illuminated cross there. And I love to see all the families getting their photograph taken at that door. Because you see, in Genesis, when God brought the judgment of death because of sin, he provided a message of salvation, a promise there would be a savior. Genesis 3.15. When he told Noah, I'm going to judge the wickedness of man with a flood, but he had Noah build an ark of salvation. And those who went through that one door were saved. And that's a picture of Jesus. God's provided an ark of salvation for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. He stepped into history and said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he'll be saved. That's the most important message for our children, for any one of us. That's the most important message for the world. But if we want people to take that message out there to our culture, we have to understand how the culture thinks. We have to understand where they're at. And we have to be equipped in the right way. And I fear that today what's happened is because many Christians have approached the issues from the top down, and in a way we've, we've been embarrassed to talk about the Bible and we've given up the Bible as a foundation, so they see what we do as hate speech. What a difference I believe it makes when you go out there with gentleness, meekness, kindness, love, and help them understand you're my family and I, and I love you, but... I have a different foundation. This is why I believe what I do. If you don't have the same foundation as me, I understand you're going to believe differently. But let's talk about this foundation. Why do you not believe the Bible like I do? Let's talk about that. Let me give you some answers. Because remember, we're directing them to the Word of God that saves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I pray that every one of you here today can say that you have gone through that door, that you're saved, and that you will be challenged to go out and say, I need to be a witness in the right way so that I can reach this culture. I need to train up my children first in the right way to make sure they got the right foundation and be a shining light in our culture for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you that your word is truth. Lord, we, we just praise you that you have 
sent your son that you stepped into history to die on a cross for us. Help us to get that message to the world, the message of salvation, but help us to do it in the right way and help us never to be ashamed of your word, to understand the culture where it's at so that we can be the best communicators that we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.